Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Total Biscuit. I'm here to ask and answer one simple question. But you have his shovel knight. I can also answer a second question if you so desire. Why the hell did it take this bloody long to get a video out on shovel knight? I'm sorry. I've had a really rough week. <laughs> it's not been good. No, it's probably going to get worse, but almost there. Almost there. Anyway, Shovel Knight, Kickstarter title from a company called Yacht Club Games. They proposed the notion that people may indeed wish to see a true 8-bit platformer. And people responded in spades. Ah, isn't it good? There'll be at least three more of those, if I can remember to do it. They gave them a lot of money, a significant amount of it. And eventually, Shovel Knight found its way to computers as well as, of course, the 3DS, I believe. I think it was out on Wii U and a couple of other platforms as well. And we get to play it. Now, one thing you might be wondering is, well, why on earth did people back an 8-bit platformer? It's like, have we not had enough of those? Really? Have, have we not seriously had enough of those bloody things up to this point? Well, apparently not, because people wanted this one, and we got it. The question is, is it any good? And more to the point, can you dig it? We'll find out. Let's go to the options menu. There is no mouse control, and K, K is the bloody control you use here. So, this is done in the 8-bit style, almost to a fault, to the point where, like, things like the options menu is awkward as hell to navigate unnecessarily. Edit your keyboard controls. You'll even see the NES controller up to the top there. Needless to say, we do have more buttons than that. However... Since this is, indeed, inspired by NES classics of old, they don't give you those buttons. Which does mean that you will be doing things like this. Relic input type, up and attack. Now, thankfully, you can change it to button, and then go to controller. Not controller, sorry, let's try that again. Go to keyboard, and then you can actually select relic, as you can see down there. Now, if I change that back to up and attack then you will notice that Relic disappears. So thankfully you can do that, you've just got to reconfigure it. The default controls are a little bit wonky because of that button configuration. As I said, hey look, you don't have enough buttons for this, so you wouldn't have it on an NES controller. Well, thankfully you can in fact change that, which is good. Outside of that, there are really no graphics options to speak of, and that shouldn't really surprise you. It is done in the 8-bit style, and all the other options are really there as you would expect. It's just navigating them, it's, it's a bit fiddly. Honestly. Okay, let's get into the game, shall we? And as you can see, this is 2 hours, 18 minutes, and 14 seconds in. And this is, of course, as always, my first impression. There's a lot of other profile spots available if you don't wish to overwrite and things like that, so feel free. Alright, so welcome to the Shovel Knight overworld, very much done in the style, of course, of Mario Brothers, where you'll be able to move around the overworld and pick various levels. You're, you're gonna be gated in terms of the content you can go into. I can go to the Plague Knight's place, I can go to the Treasure Knight's place, but I cannot go past these locked gates as of yet. I can also go down to this one right here, which is the Knuckles Quarry, which is kind of a bonus level, designed to hopefully allow you to earn a bunch of currency. Although more often than not, it actually ends up with you getting horribly screwed over. Okay, I'm going to do one of the simpler levels to begin with, and then I'll show you something that's a little bit harder. Let's go to Pride More Keep, shall we? Why not? All right, let us begin with the shoveling. So you can immediately notice that this certainly looks an awful lot like an NES platformer. And rightfully so, because that is actually what they were looking to achieve with this title. Wow. I am a moron. <laughs> that was dreadful. I don't think this plaything is going to end up going very well, is it? Oh, never mind. Okay, so what have we- Come on! <laughs> Get your head together! I know I've had a bad day, but this is terrible. This is ridiculous. Come on. Okay, so you are the named Shovel Knight. He has a shovel, as you have probably realized. That's his primary weapon. You can use it to shovel. You can also use it to grab items rather than jumping into them, which is rather handy. And you can do a ducktail style bouncing move, which will do damage as well. So if I want to kill him, just do that. It also allows you to dig things up and dig through parts of the level. Only preset parts of the level. This is not Terraria or anything along those lines. So you'll just be digging through the bits it lets you dig through. That often allows you to discover various things like hidden treasures and so on and so forth. Actually, yeah, the best way to go up there is actually just to go that way. There we go. And then I can grab all of that stuff. Now, you're collecting gems so that you can buy upgrades for your character. 
and that will of course allow you to get more health also gain more mana which you can use for your items like this for instance which is a phasing device it allows you to phase out for a short period of time which will make you immune to damage useful for some of the platforming puzzles in fact there's an entire bonus level that's really focused on the use of that particular item and you can't actually i don't think you can yeah i'm almost certain you can't do it without it it's impossible so it is what it is i wonder if i can actually go along this way now i can't Sometimes it's unclear as to whether or not you can actually go to a particular side and onto a different screen. But always assume that any drop is probably going to kill you. <laughs> it usually does. So outside of that, I mean, that really is all the game kind of has to it. You have to head over to the inventory to change out your relics, which is kind of annoying. If I want to use the relic, I press up and attack, or I can get the I can get the button option as well, which I would recommend. Up and attack is a little bit unreliable. It can mean that you end up using a relic when you don't mean to, so you probably don't really want to be using that. I'd change the defaults pretty much immediately on that one. There we go. But it does pause the game when you go to the inventory, and you've got to kind of select the item you want, which usually requires quite a lot of button presses to get there. Something like, if I want to select the Chaos Sphere, and I happen to have the Flare one selected, I've got to go all the way along here, select that, there we go, and now I can use the Chaos Sphere. Now, of course, on a PC, you would think you'd be able to bind most of these to different keys, and this menu could have been a lot easier, especially if they'd put in some kind of mouse support, but they haven't done that. And you can make the excuse that it's kind of commitment to its... Oh, good old 8-bit ways or whatever, but I still find it annoying nonetheless, and I think that's a commitment that I could have certainly done without, <laughs> frankly. I'm not overly concerned about that. Alright, let's get ourselves a chicken. There we go. That's all of that. It's mostly an action platformer. The various levels have different gimmicks as well as, of course, different enemies to tackle. There are various kinds of, various ways of traversing blocks. There's a quarry later on in the game that I need an item which allows me to do kind of a shovel dash through the dirt. And that allows me to sort of dash across the level and not fall into pits. I do not have that item yet, which means that I can't do it. So there's a little bit of Castlevania in there for good measure saying, hey, you know, you really need this ability or item to actually complete this particular level or puzzle. Although for the most part, it doesn't seem like you need any of that for the main levels. Maybe you need it later on, but I've only used the phasing device for one specific... Oh, Christ. For one specific bonus level. Now, a lot of people are giving this game a huge... Damn it. Good job there was a save point right there. A lot of people are giving this game a huge amount of praise, and one has to ask, of course, is it justified, and why exactly is Shovel Knight getting a bunch of praise, whereas a bunch of other of these kind of retro-style platformers get slammed for just doing the same thing as all the others? I mean, indie games lately have got a reputation of just being... Uh, I hate the term hipster, but it's something that jackasses tend to use to describe this kind of stuff. Of just... Being retro for the sake of being retro, like, a lot of people view it as a form of laziness. Just saying, look, I don't have the talent necessary in order to create a game that actually has good graphical fidelity. So I'm gonna create something that looks like it was made 20 years ago. And, yeah, there actually are plenty of games that I feel have done that. I think probably one of the worst examples would be Fist Puncher. I think that really did make itself look like a bad NES game just for the sake of it, and it didn't actually benefit the game in any way. Here's the thing about Shovel Knight, right? The design philosophy as well as the aesthetic of the game are all very much tied together in one big loving hole. Yeah? They created this game from the very start to actually be a homage to 8-bit titles. But here's the thing, it's better than most 8-bit titles. That's maybe the most important thing to consider. It is just genuinely better. I screwed this up, haven't I? I have. That's unfortunate. I'm sure I'll find... I th think maybe if I revisit it, I can do it again. Let's try that again. Uh, apparently I cannot. Okay. Well, this is unfortunate. I'm sure I'll find a way through some other way. It is better than most of those games, yeah? I only really say that based on my limited experience of them, though. Now, you've got to bear in mind that most of my gaming experience as a kid really wasn't done on consoles. It was done on computers of some sort. So I have a bit of a different perspective to the kind of Nintendo kids and Sega kids. I did play some Sega games back in the day. It was mostly at my friend's house across the road because he had a Mega Drive. So I, I used to play games with him. So I played stuff like Sonic and Streets of Rage and Golden Axe. And that's not where I want to stand for that, is it? No, it is not. But I didn't actually have a Mega Drive of my own. 
So I don't really have the same kind of experience. But I think it is safe to say that the design in this game is really well put together, both aesthetically and in terms of the mechanics. And obviously the mechanics are what I'm more concerned about. It's like, so what exactly are we looking for? Uh, what makes this a good 8-bit style platformer? Well, one, the degree of challenge, safe to say. I wouldn't say the game is unfair at all, which actually, of course, makes it much better than a lot of 8-bit platforms that actually were genuinely unfair, mostly because they were like designed for arcades or they were simply to obfuscate the fact that the game wasn't actually all that long. This game is fair. It does have a couple of weird tropes that are perhaps not actually necessary. Things like the idea that pits instantly kill you. D you know, is that required? To In order to actually make the game challenging? Does that feel cheap? Well, it doesn't really feel all that cheap, but there are certain problems with it. Like this, for instance, is not a pit that will kill me. Yeah, But there are other pits that look exactly like that that actually will end up killing you. I noticed on this level that there was uh, there was a couple of those pits which had sparkles next to them, which would indicate that maybe those are going to actually kill you. So that might have something to do with it, but it's a little bit tricky to notice. Oh, come on. We'll get you eventually. I have to alternate between attacks to take these guys down. There we go. That's what I like to see. I think we'll dig that out as well. In general, though, it's pretty fair. You might have noticed that when I died, I left some of my money behind. It doesn't use, The game doesn't use a life system. It uses a system which means that you lose 25% of your earnings in the level. And if you don't get back there in time, well, I wouldn't say in time. If you don't get back there without dying, then that money's gone for good. Yeah, And that's a, a very Dark Souls-esque way of doing things. Yeah, that's a, that seems like a, a fairly nice demonstration. I wonder, can I drop down here? You see the sparkles there. That indicates to me, I think, that that would kill me, but... This doesn't actually have any sparkles, and yet you die anyway. So uh, that's that's a bit of a problem that I've got with the, I suppose, the old school way of doing things. Because, of course, in, in old school games, 8-bit titles, most of the time, a pit would be a bottomless pit that would instantly kill you, yeah? But one of the main... Damn it. One of the main problems with doing that in a game like this is that not all of those pits actually kill you, and it's not necessarily consistent. Some of those pits you actually have to jump down. Although, it's it's generally a case that most of those pits are obvious, and they're like the only way you can go in a level. But you've got to bear in mind, of course, god damn it, that this is a game where you can dig through various parts of the level, so it's entirely possible that that pit actually wasn't the way to go, and you end up dying and having to go back. The checkpoints are fairly generous, but you can actually smash a checkpoint, strangely enough, in order to get a little bit of extra money, and this is a nice little risk-reward scenario. I don't really do it all that much, because really it doesn't seem to give you, it doesn't really seem to give you that much cash in the first place and it's a bit risky and it means that if you fail a platforming section then all that ends up happen god damn it all that ends up happening is that you end up going back to the previous checkpoint and have to keep going back and repeating it over and over again it's mildly annoying but at the end of the day you're always going to have that kind of system in a game like this. It is designed to be a reasonably challenging platformer in the old style. So you are going to have platforming that kills you. God damn it. Like that. And I've lost half of my gold, by the way, through all of this. So this is pretty, pretty rough. It's actually quite difficult to play when you're commentating. It, it's not, it's definitely not the hardest game. I mean, it's certainly not on I want to be the guy level. But at the end of the day, it is also fair. So... It's challenging enough, like, I, I feel you will die enough to kind of get your enjoyment out of that level of challenge, but... <sighs> Idiot. Idiot. But it shouldn't be too frustrating, you know? Really, right now, I'm frustrated at my own ineptitude rather than the game itself, and that's kind of the important thing. There's other stuff like instant kill spikes, which can certainly be annoying. I mean, there's a bonus level whereby you use the phase item that I talked about earlier in order to avoid taking damage from those spikes. It's very easy to screw that up, and I actually, by the end of it, thought, you know, there was no point in me doing this bonus level because I actually lost more money than I gained by doing it because there is no... I don't believe there was any checkpoint on that level. Oh, no! No! Oh. I'm bad at platformers. Have you realized this yet? I certainly hope so. I think we're actually... Now, I'm going to get one more shot at it, and then I might go to another level, because I, I don't think you want to see me repeating the same damn thing over and over again. 
But it, it's hard to like criticize the game based on those little 8-bit tropes because I don't necessarily think they're unfair. I think they're just maybe unnecessarily punishing and frustrating, but at the end of the day, it's still my fault for running into them in the first place. So, you know. It's like I'm not expecting sympathy, and I'm certainly not criticizing the game for including those elements. There we go, and I lost most of my money going through that, but there you go. I'm certainly not criticizing the game for including those elements. I'm just, I'm questioning whether or not it was entirely necessary. I guess you just get away with it by saying, yo, bro, we wanted to be as 8-bit as possible. This stuff was in those games. Yeah, you're right, it was. It absolutely was. I'll tell you what wasn't in a lot of those games, the really tight controls. And uh, also quite a lot of creativity when it came to the level design itself. Like, each level is, of course, very uniquely themed with its own monsters, but more often than not has some very interesting... I mean, I hesitate to even call them gimmicks, because I think that's kind of unfair, but... Some really interesting mechanics that usually only get used on that level and make the whole thing feel really unique. I dig that a great deal. Yeah. I really do. All right, so at the end of every level, there will be a night boss. Now, each of these night bosses actually could act differently to the previous time that you faced them. They have a move set, but they don't do it in the same order. Yeah, so you just kind of have to learn their moves and when it's actually safe to attack them. So you know, we seem to be doing fairly well here. There we go. Okay, want to avoid that? Maybe hit him with a couple of those. Probably don't want to be hit by that. That seems like a fairly bad idea. This guy should probably go down fairly easily. There we go. And we can follow up with that. There we go. Nice. Okay. Yeah, he's definitely not one of the more difficult bosses. And then you beat him and really that's it. And that's the end of the level, as you would expect. You know, it all finishes up with the boss fight. But all of these boss fights really feel quite unique in their own way. And they have a bunch of different mechanics. The, I think it was the Grave Knight or the Spectre Knight. I can't remember which. Who is basically just Grim Reaper. Uh, had this mechanic that was actually quite infuriating where the level would go dark. And in fact, they demonstrated that mechanic in the level prior to that. Which is a really classic way of introducing the player to the mechanic before you hit them full on with it. And I approve very much that they did that. You know, it just demonstrates really good design and a lot of forethought on the part of the designers themselves. Uh, it's it's far beyond simply saying, hey, we're doing this for nostalgia's sake. It's this is I think Shovel Knight is more of a statement that says, you know, all that all of those old games and that design philosophy, here's why they're considered classics. It's not nostalgia. We're gonna make a game that is as good as that in 2014, and you're going to enjoy it on its own merits. Uh, and that's actually how I feel about it, because I don't have nostalgia for most of those games. When I was a kid, I didn't play things like Contra, because I didn't have an NES. I didn't play Castlevania. I didn't play that stuff. I played them much later in life, so I don't hold the same level of nostalgia for that stuff as many people otherwise would. But what I absolutely see in a game like this is its own merit. Uh, could it have worked, say, with a different aesthetic, for instance? Yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, it would still be a very competent platformer on its on its own without you having to resort to this pseudo 8-bit style that's going on here. You know, they did cheat in certain ways when it came to the graphic style just to make it look a little bit better with modern technology. But for the most part, you know, it looks like a game that could have been released on the NES. I don't know, like it's it's almost Super Nintendo, but I'd say the color palette stops it from going all the way. It actually looks like one of those later one of those much later NES titles, just kind of towards the end of the life when the SNES was coming out. Could it have worked without it? Yeah. Does the aesthetic add to it? Well, I... I think? I don't know if it does or it doesn't, yeah? I absolutely think that it is appropriate, though. Yeah? The fact of the matter is they were... They wanted to make a game that was a full homage to 8-bit titles, and they seem to have succeeded in doing just that. And that means the aesthetic kind of has to match up with the expectation, right? And really, it's not like it looks bad. It actually looks pretty damn great for what it is. And the music as well really helps to add up for that. Ooh, interesting. Okay, looks like we've got ourselves a little bonus stage here. Every now and again, you'll get these. Uh, this one, in fact, is actually, by the looks of it, a level that will scroll, and I'm probably going to die if I miss all the stuff. But it gives you a reason to revisit a lot of this. It's also possible for monsters to invade an area like the village, and you get, like, one shot at it. If you fail, then you just don't get the reward. It's really as simple as that, but that's, that's kind of how it works. I thought there was a way to get down there. I guess you probably just do... Uh, I think I messed this up badly. 
No, we can still keep going. There we go. Get a little bit of extra cash. I'm glad it's being generous. It's like, yeah, you seem to be low on cash. You have a bonus level. This is nice as well because it really does a great job of elongating the experience. Considering there aren't all that many levels, but this stuff often gives you a reason to, to go back to a bunch of it, which is, is pretty cool. And that was quite a short little experience. You know, that was done in like a minute. So I appreciate that they put stuff like that in. But the fact of the matter is that this game seems to be just a really excellent example of a well-designed platformer. All right, let us strike the earth, shall we? Absolutely. This is a kind of underwater level, as you've probably noticed here. And of course, the water kind of slows you down and makes you drift a little bit. So uh, it's a mechanic, as far as I know, that will probably only end up getting used in this level because that seems to be the way that they've designed things. It does a great job of keeping things fresh, as I said, by introducing you to new mechanics all the time and also giving you relics which change your playstyle. Apparently, it's also possible to get different armors and things like that, but I haven't actually seen one around yet, so I'm not exactly sure how you get those. The boss fights are interesting and challenging. The levels are of a decent length. Some of them are, are quite long, actually. Uh, I think that's fine. You know, the, the checkpoints are generous enough, and of course, if you, you want to play with a bit of a challenge, you can destroy the checkpoints in order to gain a little bit of extra wealth. There we go. See, even just like minor things like the the gems and the jewels actually floating in the water. It's just it's just a level of attention to detail that you just generally do not see outside of the absolute classics. And it's very hard to find a criticism to to level at this. Yeah. I mean, obviously with a game like this you've you've got to try and judge it within the context of what they're trying to achieve. And obviously what they're trying to achieve with this Let's see if I can actually... Oh, okay. That did the job. There we go. What they're trying to achieve with this is something that evokes memories of old 8-bit classics and is more importantly on the level of those classics. And I think it is safe to say that Shovel Knight is on that level. I really do think that it is. I assume a lot of people will probably say, yeah, you know what, you can't compare this to like Castlevania. That was a classic. Yeah, but why? Bollocks. Spikes! Why was Castlevania a classic? And what does this game... Does this game do the same sort of things that Castlevania does? And does it do it as well? And in my experience, yeah, I think it does. I really do. Like, my first impression of it is like, wow, this game controls well. It's super tight. The only problem I really have with the controls is the inventory system being a bit clunky and the way that the default controls handle the use of relics. But again, you can change that. So... That's not really a huge problem. Outside of that, the jumping is always accurate. I've never felt like I messed up a jump because the controls were either sluggish or they didn't really give me the appropriate amount of feedback. I always feel like I have perfect control of my jumps in a game like this. This That's really important. You know, There's not a lot of platformers that do that perfectly, and I think Shovel Knight is probably one of them that does. Like, it is that damn good. And it's just constantly kept me engaged with new challenges. I like the fact that there is an upgrade system in the game. Gives you a reason to play the to play the game better and try not to die. Yeah? And I think that when once you put an economy into a game like this, you do give people an additional incentive not to die without having to resort to a live system. So I feel that the, the sting of losing cash and of course having to replay the same bit is probably more than enough to keep people on their toes. At least it has kept me on my toes at any rate. There's also a new game plus mode once you've beaten the game, so you know there, there is kind of a reason to replay it. You replay it with all your upgrades and it gets a little bit more challenging, but I have heard people say that the new game plus mode is not actually that hard, so that, that's certainly worth considering. But yeah, it seems like it's stuffed full of content, it's made with love, and more importantly, it's just really, really well designed. Everything that's done in this game is done for a reason, and that reason is generally not, we did this for 8-bit nostalgia. That's the, the key point. There are some decisions which you can argue, yes, they were done because 8-bit games did them, but you've then got to examine whether or not that actually hurts the game. And in my opinion, outside of minor annoyances, such as... You know, these spikes and things like that? No, I don't think they do cause problems for the game. I, I think they prov- Son of a- <laughs> They provide an additional, if frustrating, challenge. Maybe they don't need to be there, but I don't also see a reason to take them out, you know? It's like, well, they're there, okay.
I'm not too bothered by them. It's fine. I'm not really all that upset. Let's just try not to jump as much, and I'm sure everything will be fine. There we go. I'll just use... <laughs> yeah, screw this. I'm just going to use the phasing to bypass all that. I should also give mention to the excellent soundtrack. Really, really good. Awesome, awesome soundtrack. Stands on its own merits as just a really good piece of ch chip music, frankly. Uh, a, a lot of soundtracks like this are just done again for the sake of nostalgia. I think that it, this just sounds good on its own. It's like, it's not saying, oh, well, even for chip music, it sounds great. It's like, no, it just sounds good. Like, it happened, the genre happens to be chip music, and it happens to do its genre very, very well. And it should be applauded for that. It's not a case of it sounding good despite being chip music. It's a case of it's good sounding chip music. Hard to argue with it, really. I think this, the composer is certainly very talented. And it clearly evokes the kind of style of old while still having just this, this hint of modern composing involved in it. It's cool. Shovel Knight is just in general a really, really good platformer. Yeah? It is probably the best retro style platformer that I have ever played, to the best of my knowledge. Uh, it takes a lot of lessons from old games as well as some from new ones, and it combines them together to make something that truly stands on its own. Uh, if Castlevania, if Super Mario, if uh, Contra and things like that didn't exist, would this game still be considered good? Uh, maybe that's the litmus test. And in my opinion, yeah, it absolutely would. It really would. And in fact, it would probably be considered a classic at that point, and rightfully so. The game is damn good. Very, very good indeed. Really impressive work, and honestly, just one of those titles which makes me feel really happy that Kickstarter exists. For all of its faults, Kickstarter does allow games like this to come into being, and we're just enriched by the fact that a game like Shovel Knight actually exists and is available for us to play. And I am not the kind of person that likes this sort of game, and you know that, you're well aware, but Shovel Knight has impressed me on both the technical level and in terms of the design of its mechanics, and that is a giant fish. The game just, it never fails to surprise. That's what I love about it. You know, there's always something new to see, and that's a bottomless pit. Although I do tend to see the new things time and time again because I die too much, but... It's, it's just really, really good. There's not much to complain about, really, with Shovel Knight. Gotta admit. So there you go, folks. Shovel Knight, currently available on Steam for $15 or your regional equivalent. My name has been Total Biscuit. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.